Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ash Antuna. I'm uh, with the Research Data uh, Services team here at uh, uh, Research Technologies. Uh, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining our uh, workshop on uh, Azure in uh, research. Uh, uh, today, uh, the uh, uh, Microsoft uh, US education team is with us. Uh, they will present uh, how you can make the most of uh, Microsoft Azure. And uh, the focus is going to be machine learning. So uh, we'll start with the, some introductory material and uh, build up on to uh, uh, toward uh, using uh, uh, machine learning resources on Azure. Uh, with further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Joey. Thank you, Asin. Is this microphone working? I can't really tell. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your time. And thank you for being here today. I'm Joey Abraham, account executive at Microsoft. I have just recently taken over Indiana University uh, starting this past fall. So thank you for, for the Microsoft relationship. That's, that's what I meant to say, not taking over the university. But uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be working with such bright minds. I have our whole, our whole team here with us today. I have David, I'll let him introduce himself in a moment, Chad and Patrick. We're here for a full day, a uh, full afternoon of hopefully educational material. I wanted to throw it out there that uh, some of the, the things that you see here, they can be applied in a variety of different ways to research. So in the back of your head, I'd just like to challenge you, if you think of something cool that you want to try, uh, go for it. We'd love to support it and, and learn more about what your needs are in research. So I hope you enjoyed the day here. Uh, enjoy some of the content that we have. And we want it to be communicative. So please ask questions, interrupt us, make us go back to go over things that we might glance through too quickly or tell us to speed up. We just want to do this at your pace and make it conversational. And hopefully it'll be a great educational day here for us all. So with that said, I'll let David introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Ayo. I'm an Azure Technology Solutions Professional covering education for the North and South Central. Just some background, I worked uh, 18 years uh, prior to joining Microsoft at the University of Miami, doing IT infrastructure, system administrations, so my area around Azure is focused on infrastructure and, and some, some platform as a services as well. Uh, what we wanted to do is uh, start out with kind of like level set, do a quick overview of Azure, and then we're gonna we're gonna also cover some you know, some re uh, examples of Azure and research. Uh, Chad is gonna come up here and just talk briefly about some of those examples, and then we're also. Um, Patrick is going to join us and also talk about more detail about some of the machine learning and research technologies. Again, if there's any questions, feel free to stop. I you know, want to make this informal. I know some of you may already be familiar with some of the Azure concepts we're going to cover, but we'll quickly go over some of these. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So again, everyone's going digital. Uh, you know, we're all carrying around mobile devices. There are about a million devices per hour uh, coming online. So we're really transforming into a digital world. 60% um, of computing is going to be in the public cloud. In the public cloud by 2025. So we all have to start looking as to how we're going to leverage this in our research, in our institutions, and you know, where does this best fit? Again, over 90% of Fortune 500 companies are already leveraging public cloud like Azure. Let's talk about where does this, how can we leverage this? Again, the public cloud will allow you to set up, give you that speed. So very, very quickly set up your workloads in Azure. Typically, I remember at the University of Miami, I would have to, every time I would need to request resources, I would have to go submit a request order, submit a, a plan. Maybe it'll take weeks to to you know to get approval. If networking needed to be involved, if, if, if you know security needed to be involved, that it needed to be reviewed. It takes you know a typical project would probably take months just to get off the ground. So the public cloud gives you that ability to be able to set up in minutes, uh, be able to quickly troubleshoot issues. Again, giving us the flexibility to connect with existing tools, and we'll go over some of those technologies. Again, in the simplicity. 
So really, you don't have to be a, a network architect. You don't have to be a a you know a, a, a whole you know system you know system administrator. We'll, we'll give you the tools we do very easily from a web interface, provision a virtual machine, provision a, a service. Microsoft really has changed. Um, we're really now embracing open source. In fact, over 40% of new workers coming into Azure are uh, open source Linux VMs. So really totally different Microsoft that you may have experienced in the past. We're building and innovating with our ecosystem of helping you with your digital infrastructure, as you can see here from the DevOps perspective, applications, database and middleware infrastructure. We're really offering all the services available to, for you to be successful in your uh, research, research and your work. Here's an example. Here's an example. So over 600, so over 600 new releases in the last 12 months. For those who are this, uh, online, can you please mute your microphone? Thank you. So with over 600, with over 600 services being rolled out, continuous innovation in Azure. Again, for you, for you to run your workloads in Azure, we need to make sure that you trust the public cloud. And there is no public cloud with over more certifications um, out there. Here's an example of, you know. Azure leading our industry with uh, requirements for certifications. Any, anything from a PCI, FERPA, uh, you know, all the, all the different certifications. Again, even Azure government data centers that we were able to offer. Again, security is top of mind with all of our customers that we talk to. It really remains the, you know, the top concern of moving workloads to Azure. And, we want to make sure that we're offering the latest technologies to be able to, you know, alleviate those concerns. We have we offer our intelligence data center with our Microsoft Cyber Defense Operations Center, making sure that we have the, you know, we act, Microsoft actually spends over a billion dollars a year in re, billion dollars a year in research for uh, security. A lot of that research is is being developed to secure those resources. We also have the um, Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit helping your, our, our attorneys, our investigators, helping you control and protect those workloads. And just some highlights of our reach across our data centers. We have over 2 million kilometers of data center fiber, 72 uh, terabytes per second backbone, 40 plus Azure regions, and over 100 plus data centers. Yeah, we take a layered uh, approach to security from access approval, background check, system checks to access our data centers, to uh, video coverage in the perimeter, to two-factor authentication, um, 24 by 7 security operations, and our server environment um, having access to uh, for employees to be able to log in with secure instruction bins. From an Azure computing uh, capabilities on the left is what you're, you know, for those of you that may not be familiar with all our offerings, on the left we have the on-premises private cloud data center. We do offer um, equivalent uh, with our infrastructure as a server where the physical server is managed by Azure and you're only responsible for sorry. you provision and 
and manage the virtual machine, the operating system, the application, the data access for the infrastructure as a service. We also uh, provide platform as a service, where as you can see now is Azure um, provisions and manages the runtime, the operating system, compute, network, and storage, but you still manage the data and applications. So think about running SQL Server as a service. That's an example. Or, or mobile web app development, where you're still responsible for the application, but again, you're no longer responsible for managing the layers below. Then we also have software as a service. And does it, all of you in Office 365? Using email. Well, it, think of it as um, when you're using Office 365 or if you're using some other email service, this is where you know, the public cloud or Azure will be responsible for managing the application, the operating system, all down the entire layer to compute network and storage. And then you're only responsible for managing um, the data. Real quickly, here's an example of all the different uh, services that you can leverage from a compute perspective. Again, virtual machines, um, virtual machine skill sets, batch. For web and mobile, you have web applications, API apps, from Internet of Things. You know, we have this capability of having the IoT hub. So as, as, you, as you think about developing research, having all these sensors across and around the field and be able to accept those uh, those telemetry into the you know into into Azure to be able to run your analytics from a storage perspective uh, blobs tables queues files and disks from a database perspective SQL databases document DB uh, again security networking intelligence developer service a whole slew of services that you'll be able to leverage for your projects Again, just of some core infrastructure, again, whether you're going to be leveraging compute with virtual machines, storage uh, with disk and blob, networking with virtual networks, and our management layer that we also offer um, with log analytics, backup, site recovery, everything from a web-based console, so you don't have to go ahead and have to deploy additional infrastructure, especially when you're leveraging these, uh, these systems online. Again, some recent announcements uh, were with Azure Site Recovery allowing you to have workloads to be running at on premises in your data center, be able to replicate uh, to Azure for DR purposes, uh, supporting the concept of managed disks, so you don't have to have um, uh, be dealing with the minutia of, of your storage accounts. Increased disk sizes of up to four terabytes on Azure VMs, and also disaster recovery of infrastructure virtual machines in Azure. So if you're running a virtual machine in Azure, you can protect it and replicate it to another region, all from within the, the same console. Just a quick overview of the com uh, compute designations. We offer everything from entry-level VMs for your dev test uh, workloads, and we'll show you this in the, in the portal in a few minutes, where they're you know, just perfect for dev test workloads, all the way to large memory VMs so if you have databases that you that require a lot of uh, memory. Those, those are the G series virtual machines. To high performance VMs, the H series. So batch process, fluid dynamics, simulations. Those are the those are the virtual machines that uh, you all will be focusing on. And also the N series VMs. And L, L series is uh, storage optimized. So the NoSQL databases, data warehousing. Those those would be the those VMs that you leverage. And the N series, which are GPU enabled VMs, so graphic based applications, remote visualizations, uh, deep learning uh, technologies, and all the way to the largest VMs, um, which are certified for SAP LAN large instances. From a storage perspective, um, all, all database, all data that is uh, saved to Azure is replicated three times. So you have the confidence of Whatever blob of data that you have, you have three copies of a single data center. We also offer GRS, so three additional copies of that data in a different data center altogether. 
again, in, in, we also offer the REST API. So if you have any, any workers that the programming that you want to do, you directly want to uh, connect to the storage, you can do that over the REST API or CTS. Again, so you can have six replicas, two regions, and to protect you against a uh, regional disaster. And you have the concept of geo replication with the GRS option. So if you have another data center at least uh, over 400 miles, you can replicate that data to that location. To that data center. From a connectivity uh, perspective, we have multiple connectivity options. Obviously, from the public internet, internet too, we have that connectivity option. We have secure point to site connectivity, um, site to site connectivity with VPNs. Uh, you can connect to Azure compute. And then also express route or private connectivity, which offers you a um, low latency, high bandwidth connectivity. Okay, some additional options here. From within the, the Azure cloud, if you have multiple uh, regions in Azure, you can do VNet peering. So you have high bandwidth all using the Azure backbone for inner region VNet to VNet connectivity. We also have uh, VNet to VNet using VPN gateway. So you have, if you want to go across regions, again, you have 40 regions, uh, over 40 uh, regions across the world with Azure. So if you had different regions uh, around, let's say, you know, let's say one in Europe and one in, in North America, you can leverage VPN gateways as well. And we're also introducing a global peering, so you can actually use the backbone as well for that. And we also have VNet to VNet peering via Express Route. So many different connectivity options available for your workloads. This is an example of the cross-premises connectivity overview. Again, you can connect via point-to-site tunnels, site-to-site -site VPN tunnels over the um, private uh, wide area network using Express Route. So very flexible. Many, many different options. Again, let's, like we talked about, a lot of investment around securing your, your data uh, from our cyber defense unit to all the, all the investments that we're doing around, around security. One of the core tenets there is going to be called Azure Security Center, which is a, serv a service right within the Azure portal that lets you gain that visibility and control. Um, so you'll be able to see if you have a server that's being under attack from an external host. Let's say you, you exposed uh, your RDP uh, ports to the internet. And you're, you're getting brute force attack. The Azure Security Center actually will alert you, telling you you have these many uh, attacks, authentication attempts against your RDP servers. Leveraging our, our machine learning and behavior analytics, we can alert you uh, telling you not only, let's say this server was compromised, will alert you as well as to what happened in that server. So for example, maybe a, a, a process was run to go ahead and try to um, execute some other some, some other malware. We'll alert you that in the Azure Security Center. And then if you start, let's say that um, that process starts scanning your, your, your infrastructure and, and elevating it access, maybe attacking an account, we'll also alert you that as well. So really helping you be proactive um, as far as your security. This is another set of tools. Again, just rounding up the set of tools that are available in Azure to help you manage, monitor, and diagnose. We have Azure Advisor. Again, telling you what are the things you need to do to make sure that um, you're running your virtual machines, your workloads in an optimized fashion. Um, we give you application insights, giving you deep insights into uh, the web applications that you may be running. Again, telling you Hey, there may be there may be a spike in usage, and that's causing performance issues. You want to get ahead of that, right? You don't want to wait for that that application or that service to start having issues, sending uh, incidents or tickets to your to your infrastructure. Application insights give you that insight uh, um, before before issues arise. Azure Network Monitor to be able to monitor your network. Um, uh, network infrastructure in case there's any issues with networking. And again, giving you abilities like from the cloud shell. So if you have a browser, you'll be able to, from a browser, any any OS, any browser, be able to run commands to manage your infrastructure. 
And again, Azure Security Center for your security insights and a mobile app. So regardless where you are, if you have a mobile phone, you'll be able to uh, monitor your infrastructure. Again, real quickly on the um, Azure Marketplace, not only do we offer all the things that we talked about, the built-in infrastructure as a service, platform, software as a service, but we're really for Azure Shines is we have the whole plat uh, partner ecosystem using the Azure Marketplace to be able to, you pick the best of breed applications to make your, um, whatever your solution you're trying to build, whether it's for research, whether it's for you know delivering content to your to your uh, your peers around the world, you'll be able to leverage the best of breed technologies. And here's an example of those partner integrations. Again, whether whether you're you're a Cisco environment, whether you have Nagios, whether you know you're using Jenkins or Hadoop, all those all those services are available in our in our marketplace to help helping you be be successful. At this point, let me let me just dive in real quick to the Azure portal, and just go with you know real quick, just show you some of the some of those technologies. Any questions so far? Again, we kind of did a really quick overview level set of, of all the Azure services, but if there's any any questions, feel free to. Actually, before we, we go into the in, into the into the Azure portal, Chad, you want to just quickly go over some of like the eBird, real quick. So what we'll do is we'll go over the eBird and then we'll dive into the Azure portal and go over a couple of other technologies, Azure Media Services, and the security and insights. Now, while we're bringing that up, just a quick, quick overview of folks in the room. I mean, what kind of you know, what departments or what workloads are you uh, working on? Projects are you working on? Start over here. Department, maybe. Department workloads are you working on? Projects are you working on? Back there. Right. Great. So we're going to quickly show you a couple of examples where using cloud technologies, we'll be, we're helping research scientists you know, help with their challenges. Right? You, you, you want to be able to Leverage the public cloud for all these massive data sets that you're working on your projects. Like this. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to find out where where, we, where this fits, right? Sometimes it, it doesn't make sense to put 
do everything in scale and use this hybrid approach. And we're going to cover a couple of examples using a couple of our um, art and institutions that have leveraged the technology. Awesome. Thank you. So when you start looking at this, this kind of really comes down to basic research needs um, that you guys may be familiar with. So we'll go through some of these topics. It's going to be grapple simple provisioning. Is that a problem here today? Do we have a loud enough course? When we submit a job, does that take a while to get through the research um, and get into the super peer in order to get the uh, results that we're looking for? Analytic tools. You know, with Azure, with machine learning and AI, uh, from the standpoint, we actually have a lot of great tools where we can actually help out researchers. Um, you'll provide a lot more uh, fast results in my area. Looking at this pay as you go, think about grants. Think about those federal grants we receive from NSF, NHI, or NIH uh, from that perspective. How fast, how do I keep track of those grants? How do I keep those results? How do I show that I did X, Y, and Z when I received, received those federal grants? Um, as as um, Dave was talking about earlier, you know, supporting HIPAA, FISMA. Also, what we're starting to see a lot more when we're getting grants is actually from the DOD standpoint. So DOD has certifications compliance um, from that area and be able to go from that area and keep going. Uh oh. I think it's on the natural control. Modern technology. I don't want to go. All alone. All right. Well, for anyone that's on remote, don't worry. Everyone can get a copy of these slides. I can send them out. Uh, not a big deal. Um, really looking at the hybrid model for infrastructure, service platform, service software, service. As we mentioned before, there's a large investment been made here on campus at the university. But how do I actually leverage? How can I burst up into Azure and be able to crunch numbers, crunch, uh, crunch a job, and be able to get the results I'm looking for? And quickly uh, deploy to support a lot of different use cases. So this is exactly what Cornell University was looking at. Cornell University with eBird, tracking the birds, how they migrate from North America down to South America, back and forth. This is exactly what they had. They're crunching numbers internally, taking a long time, wasn't keeping up, and they're delaying the results of what they wanted to see. So as part of this, we start taking a look at what it does. So as I mentioned before, it's about predicting the um, birds, crunching the data, showing the maps. I mean, I'll, I'll actually put to a live map um, that where we can see people checking in on their phones, taking pictures of the uh, birds, where they're migrating to and from, especially as winter's moving here in North America, and be able to go through this. So this is a great use case of research at Cornell University to track the bird migrations. So when we really think about the three pillars of a global project, you know, we have an eBird portal site where People log in, they can use their phone to track the birds. We have observation apps sitting on the phone, to be able to provide that capability, and then doing the post-analysis. This is all being done in Azure. They went from months down to minutes to hours to crunch this data. Really quick, fast enough to keep going forward, and provide a value add back to everyone that's going through and the scientists that are watching us. So on, we, we take a look at the technology overview. Let's run an eBird. As we mentioned before, I'll just pull this out real quick. There we go. So first off, HD Insight. It's a Hadoop cluster. Uh, from that, be able to, um, to pull the data. It's Linux systems, Linux run on Azure. How many people know that Linux runs on Azure today? It's not Microsoft. I mean, we run everything uh, from that standpoint, except for mainframe code which is actually an interesting story about that one later. Um, but we do run everything. It's just not Windows. It's just not SQL. Microsoft has changed dramatically where we adopted open source and everything runs in the cloud um, from that capability. We look at response to climate change, analyzing, projecting, plan to support, what's happening, crowdsource citizen, uh, citizen scientists, you know, submit the site, like, sightings from the eBirds um, on their mobile apps and be able to provide that capability. A um, mass amount of data, 330 million, 10 million per month. And like I said, we'll flip over to the real live website. We'll show you exactly what's going on. And the predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is key. 
take my wood, take that data, take that unstructured data, and be able to take the data through it and be able to report on it. Very key uh, capabilities on this. And then obviously to migrate, uh, to watch the migration path being analyzed in real time. Be able to do predictive what's going to happen next year. We see some El Nino's change its pattern. What's going to happen to the birds in that community? So that's a great thing that Cornell University was able to do. Some of the eBird quotes from some of the researchers there, you know, using a series of software products are all open source. Yes, we like that. Open source is free, it's cheap, it's easy to do um, from that area. You know, using Azure, utilizing cloud computing and some on-prem capabilities, really cool capabilities to be able to do that. And be able to burst up into Azure for strong cloud computing capabilities for Hadoop, Linux, and R. Really cool capabilities as they keep on moving forward. So looking at this, research needs versus Azure capabilities. You know, rapid, simple provision of Elastic. Yes, Linux clusters, over a one third of a billion. I'll be able to provide that. Analytically tools, the systems, embedded R capabilities. Pay as you go, so pay what you need. Instead of like traditional IT, we buy for peak, like we always do. We buy large machines. How about where we can just burst up and down when I need something? When you're submitting a job into the queue, into the HPC system. Sitting there, do I need to go faster or need it in a couple days? Does it not matter to us? But have that capability to really scale that out from page you go. You know, once again, think about all the different certifications that are out there today. Like I said, I've seen more and more from NSF and NIH, but we're starting to see some DOD level certifications. As a university, when you receive those grants, we can support that up in Azure in our GovCloud into our DOD areas. We have all the certifications, as David was mentioned earlier. You know, hybrid models I mentioned before, I has passed, able to um, analyze clock from two and a half weeks to three and a half hours. That's pretty impressive from that capability. And that's just all deploying this into Azure and building this out. Elastic setup for the quick deploy and the hybrid IT advantage. Yes, sir. Yeah. Native application runs on iPhone, Droids, and all that. So uh, they built it at Cornell, and it just interfaces to the Azure public interface. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. We'd be happy. Our engineers, our researchers can help write this stuff as well, along with other researchers. Separate. Yep. Yep. Totally separate. It's just an app. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the question was basically, um, was the app um, something that was specifically written for Azure, or was it open from that standpoint, correct? I missed that one. Right. Does Azure have a way to develop an app um, from this standpoint? And the answer to that is we do have ways to do that through Visual Studio. We can definitely do that. Um, and like I said, it runs on anything that you want. This app was written. The platform, especially web apps, mobile apps, you can, if you're familiar with developing code using Xamarin, Node.js, whatever application you're, you know, you're, you're familiar with, we'll support it as well. So not only can you use Visual Studio and Xamarin to, deploy, to develop these mobile apps, but if you have developers that are familiar with you know, your system tool set, you can support it as well. You just deploy it, deploy the same way. You have FTP, HTTPS, and, and that's how we yeah, and then the rest of this, outside of Cornell University, we have a lot of other examples of universities um, utilizing. We have stuff going on at Virginia Tech. We have um, out of Sao Paulo, Department of Education. We have Kellogg School of Management, University of Texas. Um, Kellogg's actually a school, um, one of my customers. Um, but then we also have like University of Wisconsin. They're actually measuring through a grant, federal grant, cows. How often do they walk? How often do they eat? And they're actually using a internet device, internet of things, IoT device to monitor all this and be relayed back into a Hadoop cluster and be able to analyze how the cow's doing and is it good for them, is it healthy for them, do we get better meat, all the great stuff that people want to know. So it's really cool to be able to do this and be able to educate um, people like yourselves on how you can actually utilize Azure to get results much faster on um, capabilities. How many people saw the press release that just got announced yesterday from Microsoft and Cray Computers? Yes, Joey, you saw it because you're Microsoft computer. 
uh, from that standpoint. It's actually quite funny. Joey and I were actually up at Redmond about four months ago with a different university, and we were talking about Azure and Cray and how Cray is so much different than us and all this great stuff. So during the four months, what happens? We buy a, a little uh, company, Cycle Computing, that does major research um, innovations, and they're part of us now. We bought them, and they're going to tie into Azure. But then yesterday, and we heard this rumor happening four months ago, Cray and uh, Microsoft announced that, hey, we have a partnership now. If you have a Cray supercomputer, it integrates directly in Azure. How great is that? Both on Microsoft's webpage and also on Cray right now. But you can go to either one and they're talking about each other and how you can actually utilize and move jobs backwards and forwards through the job scheduler when you need it. So once again, using Azure for the bursting capabilities uh, from that capability. We don't want to replace Cray. Cray is awesome, a great customer, but also that partnership to be able to take workloads and move them back and forth is really cool. Actually, I got a slide here. Let me flip over. Any questions so far? So a couple things I just want to go back. As we're on the topic about Cray Computer, so we can talk about Jason Zander, who's awesome. Ooh, we're not seeing that. We're going to have to drag it over, huh? Oh, let me do my alt P. Duplicate. There we go. So Jason Zander wrote this up. He's our uh, corporate vice president of Azure. So we actually have Cray going on. He talks about it with our cycle computing, as I mentioned before, just our acquisition, tying in Azure into HPC, which people never thought we'd be able to. Also, again, you can go out there, you can Google this, Bing it, whatever you like to do. Um, we also can provide the links, but you know, talking about Microsoft buying cycle computing to get into big computing. And as I mentioned before, Cray, go out to Cray's main website. They actually have a link out to us talking about how to utilize Cray within Azure. So that's really cool. This is a new feature just got announced yesterday. So it's showing that Microsoft is growing continue going after research, going after the HPC workloads, because it's very important to us. And lastly, just going back to eBird, as I mentioned before, this link's out there, it's a public website, and what you're seeing is actually the yellow dots are people checking in on their phone apps live time, submitting where they're seeing birds in the trees. Um, I'm not a bird follower, so it's kind of cool, I guess, um, if you're a bird follower. Um, I'm not. But this is real time what's happening. You can see right now we have 7,047 check-ins, 48 now. Live time, and this is all being run inside Azure. Pretty cool capabilities. Just kind of show you the capabilities you can do this from a phone app to getting data analytics to show exactly where people are taking pictures and submitting stuff and tracking that data and processing it in real time. Very cool capabilities. Now, hopefully, this kind of resonates for you guys, kind of gets you thinking, we'll spin a little bit about how you can actually utilize Azure with your current environment to actually process or do something faster, better, uh, and be able to provide those analytics for them. Any questions? That data center, you have 40 different data centers around the globe that you can leverage for your research. So whether you want to get data closer to that data center and then have that data replicated across different regions in the, in, across the world, you know, start thinking of how you, or how you collaborate with other researchers. Again, leveraging the public cloud for data ingestion, you know, high performance computing, machine learning and analytics. Um, we're actually going to show you in, in a few minutes an example of how the public cloud uh, can help, you know, can help with uh, analytics and uh, machine learning uh, using video. Um, so these are things that before just weren't possible. Only a human could, could, could look at a video and, and, and recognize the face and, and do speech to text. Now the public cloud with all that computing power and, and learning models, we can actually take a video feed, do speech to text, extract metadata of the video and provide you those insights. So think of those research projects that you all are working on how you can leverage the cloud to you know, further uh, advance your, your project. Yes. I'll turn it back over to you for the... Sure. So, yeah. so,
Thanks, Chad. Let's see if we can connect again. Hopefully. Oh, it's got you. We're on the second screen. All right. Cool. All right, cool. Hopefully those uh, those on the meeting, they could see the screen now also. So let's take a really quick view of, of how the public cloud is, is helping uh, through, through machine learning um, gain insights into, into video growth trends. So really highlighting uh, a concept called uh, Azure Media Analytics and Video Artificial Intelligence, Video AI. We all have seen it, video growth, expanding exponentially. Even in your research, a lot of a lot of research, right? Eventually it's gonna be over maybe videos of, of watching, you know, subjects move across a, a field. We're talking about, you know, internet of things, maybe, you know, video cameras observing cow behavior and who knows. Videos everywhere. It, it, one of the statistics here says eighty two by year twenty twenty, eighty two percent of all IP traffic on the internet is going to be video based. And Microsoft has, believe it or not, has a lot of technologies uh, around media services. The one we're gonna focus in, again, yeah, you can upload video and encode it and transmit it, but the one we're gonna really gonna highlight is the third box there, it's called Media Analytics and Video, video AI that was just recently introduced. And so far until today, until today the, the challenge that we've had is that Again, as a human, you see a video, you only you, you had to have a human go in and, and and see a video, recognize a face, whether it's a celebrity, uh, do speech to text. So, in fact, that's one of the things I was uh, I was just remembering. When I was in first year of college, I actually worked part time in a company called Video Monitoring Services, and what that company did, I was I was an evening job for me, and the. the it was incredible because that was, the economics was awesome. I would go and watch the news feeds. I would do speech. You know, I would I would transcript the video. I would see in the in the news feed any any advertisement. Maybe in the background, when somebody talk about a news story, you see Coca Cola. I would write at at, at two minutes, three seconds. There's a, a logo of Coca Cola, and you would transcribe all that information. And then that company, what they did is they would go to Coca-Cola and, and sell them saying, hey, all these different you know, news feeds, your ad came out in all these areas and sell them that. It, it's incredible. They, they monetize that. And now the public cloud is giving you that technology. You just upload a video and we'll show you in a second. You know, go ahead and extract the metadata, spoken text, faces places, objects, or recognize all that using artificial intelligence. Uh, with call center, with the call center, you can actually get speech to text and get sentiment analysis. Some, was someone angry? If somebody calling a help desk and they were angry, you need to recognize that. Um, you can, um, you know, as that metadata is extracted from the video, you can actually search. So think of classrooms. We were talking earlier with a different group, uh, lectures. You're having these lectures, or even this presentation. There could be a speech to text and transcription happening uh, using artificial intelligence. And then at some point in the future, if that, if that video is recorded in a central place, you can go back and say, okay, he mentioned artificial intelligence. Let me just type in artificial intelligence. It'll take you straight to the moment where artificial intelligence was mentioned. So we'll actually highlight that. So imagine all those capabilities that before it would take a human to require to do, it's all now capable using media analytics and video uh, AI. So again, the ability to improve content discoverability, content value, reduce manual labor um, for security, for research, you know, observing certain type of uh, behavior. And this is the AI services that are available. There are uh, 10 audio transcript, motion detection, so uh, a lot of security uh, companies Police departments are leveraging uh, some of these video summaries, video stabilization, face redaction, object detection. And we'll see all of these real quick in a, in a, in a demo. Again, all the different industries that, that can leverage these technologies from entertainment to sports, to government, to surveillance. And 
this is the key. These are all part of Microsoft's suite of services. They're called the Microsoft Cognitive Services. All these are available through APIs. So think about your research. If you, if you, wanna, if you have research, if you have content, and you wanna leverage some of these cognitive services for your research, all of these are available as an API so you can individually leverage them. Or they can be also offered as a suite, which is this cognitive services suite. And the whole suite, it's about 35 different services. So let's bring them up here. You can see some of these. Again, some of them leveraging search, like Bing image search, and we'll show you one of these. They will take a face in a video feed and match it up against the database and say, so it is, okay, it's this person, right? Uh, from vision, emotion, you know, you see a, a, a face of a person, if the emotion is sad or mad, you, that will be able to detect that. From speech, um, speech to text, sentiment analysis, as they're talking, you will recognize whether they are angry or, or happy or all that. So all set, about 35 different services. Now, what Microsoft just recently introduced is, um, it's called Video Indexer. And what it does is it takes these, these services and bundles them together. And so you could see in one interface, and we'll, we'll show it to you right now, how by uploading a video or an audio, it will not, on, not only will run through these cognitive services, but it'll start doing correlation. So you'll be able to get sentiment analysis. You'll be able to get object tagging. So through a video, you'll be saying, okay, this is a sky, or this is a chair, or this is coffee. That, you know, object modeling. In fact, there's, in the roadmap, you'll be able to upload your own object model. So think about how you can leverage these you know, sound, video, into your, into your research. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So I'm gonna log you in right now to, actually let me, By the way, you can go to, the, this is right now in public preview. So you can go to it yourself. Just go to www.videoindexer.ai. You can log in with your account. It's free because it's in public preview. And what you do is there's an upload button here. Find that video, whether it's your kids, whether, you know, take some video that you've taken with your iPhone. Send, you know, send it to yourself download it, and then go in here and upload the video. And by the way, and I'll, I'll walk you through one example here. But it, it is, I took some, you know, some, some of the videos, some, some were news stories. One was actually a lecture. One was a call center recording. And one was for the Indiana University Visitor Center campus tour. So you upload that video, it goes ahead and, go, and runs that through those indexing services. It takes a few minutes. Again, you're leveraging the power of the cloud. So this is not something that's going to take your computer may take 30 hours to run, like, like Chad was saying for your for, for, for these analysis services. You're leveraging thousands of CPU cycles all in, 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 a, in a compute, in a cluster, to run these, these analyses. And within a couple of minutes, you have all those uh, insights available to you. So I'm going to go in here to this one. First, let me start with this one real quick. Because this one will be able to recognize some of these. So what you see here on the left hand side is the media player. This is a free media player that you can embed in your web pages. On the right hand side you see the, the metadata insights that were run once this video was uploaded and ran through the index. Some highlights here using, using the face detection API you'll be able to take the face of the, of the video that was uploaded. Uh, this happens to be the Microsoft uh, CEO, Satya. So it looked at the face, it, it, it correlated it to the database of, of, of the faces, about, I think it was 300,000 or so faces. It recognized, it shows you what percentage 
Did he appear in the video? The exact location in the video where the face appeared, so you can actually click on it and move to that point in time in the video, right? Where those faces occurred. Other people that were that were recognized in that video. And then, again, this is just for facial recognition. How about transcript? You go up here, click the transcript, and the automatically the speech to text is being transcribed and showing up. So think of it for lectures, for you know different scenarios that you can show this. And then, not only that, you also have the option here of translation. So you, let's say you have Spanish speakers that if you're doing a lecture presentation around your research, but you may have other researchers in China, in Europe, in Germany. Well, now they can listen to your lecture and and have this the, the translation in, let's say, Spanish. And now that is transcribed and translated to Spanish, they can see that. And then let's say that lecture, let's, let's go ahead and stop that here, pause for a second. And not only is it transcribed, then you also have the ability to search. So let's say there's a lecture on a particular research topic, or there's a, you know, you know lesson. The student or the researchers can go back in here and search for a particular keyword. Let's say, I think this one they talked about quantum computer, quantum computing. So I'm going to search quantum. And it returned the different points, times in the, in the video where the word quantum was was mentioned. Now, this is in Spanish. Let me go ahead and switch back to English. So not only is, was it indexed, but also in the different languages as well. So in English, the word quantum was mentioned here in 6 minutes, 28 seconds. So we can go back to that point in time of the video where they mentioned the word quantum. Okay, this is another API that's available for you to, for you to leverage. Let me go ahead and pause that. Let me go back to the insights. Again, we mentioned you know, facial, transcript, different uh, translation. Now, over here, we have another, you know, leveraging another API for keywords. So these are words that are mentioned time and time again in your, in your, in your video or audio. And you can, again, go back in here dive into that point in time of the video where those keywords were mentioned. And also we have the, like I mentioned, an, an object model of different objects that were identified by the cognitive services, such as floor, building, computer. Let me go ahead and jump to another, to another video real quick. One that is, you know, we all can relate, which is a I downloaded this one from, from the internet. So this is a, a video that I was able to download um, regarding a tour of Indiana University. Ran it through that cognitive services. Again, keywords that it was able to extract from the 35-minute from the video. So for example, they mentioned in, you know, Indiana University several times. Valentine Hall. Okay, you can click on that. It'll take you to that point in time, that point where they mentioned that particular location, the residence hall, right? And then object objects that it noticed, grass, click there. It's going to go to that point in time video where it, mentioned, it, 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 it identified grass and it identified a building. Now, not only are we doing that, but this is another API, the sentiment analysis, the speech sentiment. So as that video is going, there's different uh, sentiments that are that are identified, whether it's a neutral, positive, negative. So think about research, even even research about call centers. Imagine people calling in and speaking to a help person, and and many times there's you know quite long periods of quiet time, and maybe they're angry because they didn't get the support or the help they needed. We can actually run that analysis and report that. That the sentiment was was 
was a negative sentiment. And this one is really, I'll switch to another, another one here, which is more evident. This is a, a call center. Again, I downloaded off, off this one off the internet, which is a um, somebody calling in a salesperson trying to buy a product, and it, it was a bad experience. And you notice how initially there was a positive sentiment, but then it switched into a really negative at the end of the call. Again, just by running through that analysis services and noticing that. It's, it's yeah, it's speech patterns. So it will do the it will do the speech to text, but the the, the, the speech pattern that's where the, the analysis is happening. I can get you more information about exactly the technology they're using. Try it, maybe see if they're, they're, they're again a lot of these things they're doing it, but not necessarily they're going to tell you all the you know all the details of how they're doing. But it is a very high success rate from either the speech to text and the sentiment analysis as well. So again, this is where a lot of the researchers like you, you know, spend many, many years developing right those 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 algorithms. How to detect? How to? I mean, it's fascinating. I still don't know how how you can listen. I mean, a human like you sitting and you listen to a conversation, you know when somebody's getting angry. Now imagine now a computer system listening to that, and also doing just as good a job as you would as a human to be able to recognize that it's, that it's negative. Right? It's it's fascinating. So, yeah. <laughs> Close. Yeah. 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 Yes, absolutely. Hey, the great thing is, as soon as you go back to your office, www.videoindexer.ai, it's free. So log in with your account. Yeah. Upload your video. I'm telling you, I have customers already leveraging this, and they're seeing over 90% success rate on the speech to text. So very, very good. Uh, and again, this this is kind of like a self-learning you know, model that it keeps improving. And by the way, these keywords, you can uh, you can also improve this. That's the transcript. Yeah. yeah, they offer the APIs that you can interact with it. I, I don't, I'm not so sure you'll be able to get to see more of the back. Now, but it, yeah, now, but if you go, if you go work in Microsoft into that department, I'm sure they'll give you the, the access, right? But the great thing is, this is Microsoft is is. I'll tell you because I saw it firsthand. Ten years ago, this was not the same, the same Microsoft. It's much more open. Much again, the Azure is a platform. So although these models are available, you'll be able to extend it. You'll be able to train it. So one of the things that we heard was that this object model. Let me go back to the insights. This object model, you'll be able to define your own. So if you if you are going to be looking for certain objects. You'll be able to train the models for your own for your own benefit. So again, we're offering you the platform. And you'll be able to extend that for your own for your own uh, needs. So good. I mean, this is I mean, again, this is hopefully just a sample of the technology that you you can see that you'll be able to leverage. Oh, there's a there's a mic over there. Hello. Hi. Um, one question is that uh, uh, keywords versus annotation, whether the keywords indicator is a highly frequent uh, occurred, yeah. and uh, how about annotation? How do you identify annotation? The annotation. Let's go back over here. Yeah, the keywords are they're frequent. They, they're the frequency of the of those keywords in the in the video. The annotations is just an object, a uh, common object model. So it, it already has a of common objects that it's able to identify in the videos. So 
course, there's a there's a, an object model for person. So as as, C, as, C, as it recognizes a person, it's going to show up as an annotation. I mean, buildings, computers, floors, standing. I mean, there's thousands. Coffee. I mean, there's a whole library of that object. Model. Well, what what's going to be available is you'll be able to define your object model. So if you're let's say you're going to be you're doing research on video on let's say. So you'll be able to extend that model as well. Right now it's just you know, kind of like basic. But this is the sort of tool sets that are going to become available for you to extend and do for your own, for your own research. Uh, the follow-up question is, uh, you said you can extend the, the, the model. Yeah. Can I, um, if I do have a, a specific research interest, can I ignore your, you know, default model yeah. and create my own annotation kind of database. Yeah, yeah. Right now, the, what you see here is all the different APIs used together in this web interface. But the APIs will be available to you to do your, your own specific task if you need to do it. So definitely reach out to us. We can we can get you more information. So if you're only Let's say you're only interested in, in in the speech sentiment and nothing else, then yes, you'll be able to leverage that API and nothing else. This what's nice about video indexer is kind of like it's a showcase, right? Say, hey, let's bring all these different technologies, uh, cognitive services, and let's show it to you how, how you can see all the different things. But absolutely, you can pick and choose one of the thirty plus five cognitive services that you may want to leverage. All right. Yes, so again, great question. So this, right now, this video indexing service, it is your account. So one of the things that um, that was highlighted is, this is not being shared publicly. You'll see when you upload a video, you'll tell you, this is a, a private video or, or a public video. Private is all your data. This is not shared with any other account. All the insights is gonna be your, your account. And again, and it's right now in preview. Once it goes GA, there's gonna be there was an earlier question about what about if I'm working in a team? There's going to be role-based access, security, auditing, security. All if if you're using Azure already, you probably have a BAA agreement. So that same agreement will apply to all these Azure services. So again, all the all the security compliance certification will also apply to the service because you're using the Azure services. So and, and that's what something that Microsoft, you know. Takes, takes to heart is we, if for you to leverage some of these services, you got to trust the cloud. And you will not trust the cloud if we don't offer you the privacy tools for you to keep your data secure, right? Now, you can still misconfigure it. You can still, by mistake, do something that will, will expose some of it. That's why it's it's a collaborative thing, right? We offer, we offer the base security, we give you the tool sets, and then you help us as well to make sure that you don't we don't share this data outside. So in that, and that's a great segue because right now what I want to also show you is kind of the security tools that we mentioned earlier, the Azure Security Center. So let me log in and just give you a quick quick overview of some of the Azure security tools that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to leverage. Yes. So there's different services that offer different retention, deletion retention. For example, in uh, as far as video indexer, I don't know the exact details of how long, whether it's an immediate delete or whether it's like a 30-day or, or some period of time. But different services give you uh, different options. Right? So 
I could take that as follow up for the video image. But typically, if you delete, there's usually a, uh, depending on the service, a time where you can report it, just in case you accidentally delete it. Otherwise, you can do a hard delete in this case. That's all. So real quick, we're going we're gonna to highlight the, what's called the Azure Security uh, Center. Again, giving you insights into your security posture for any workload that you run. If you're doing research, if you're doing you know, sensitive data, of course, you can always misconfigure it. Can, you can expose a server just like if you were here on premises, misconfigure and allow anonymous access to the internet. All right. Same thing in Azure. It's a, it's a data center. We, we offer you, you know, the, the, the core services, but you can still misconfigure. The great thing about Azure Security Center is, is it's being more proactive about helping you detect those attacks or, or, or those vulnerabilities. So first thing I'm going to do is. I like this code. And what it is, is you have a server, you can throw an agent to it, it'll send all the security logs, all, all the, the configuration information. To, to this Azure service, it is your data. This is not you know, Microsoft reading. This is what we do is we enhance the data using machine learning, behavioral analytics, all the billion dollar plus per year investment that we have around security to let you be proactive about your data. So I remember when I was at the University of Miami, we got a server that got compromised. It was like chickens with, with heads cut off, right? The security team went around there doing their own search for the logs to see what they found. The networking team did something else. The application team was trying to see what they could find. And sometimes all the groups don't communicate really well and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what happened. Now imagine having all those tools that's available to you all from one console. That's, that's what you have. Again, you'll have recommendations, so kind of like best practices. If you have a SQL database, have a cluster, if you have some server, they'll go through the best practices and tell you, hey, you should enable this firewall, you should do this, you should do that to help you help improve your security status. Also, the one we're going to focus on right now is the alerts and incidents. So what if you're under attack? Most of the time you don't know. You may have a server with a port available to the internet, you're being attacked, and you have you have you don't know. So now Microsoft will give you that level of insight as key. You're under attack. This is what you should do. Let's let's go ahead and show you that. So I'm going to dive in here. And what it's showing you is over time, how's your you know the incidents that could that have happened, right? There could be medium, low type incidents. Could it be some you know some some process that was executed here down here below was a a failed RDP brute force attack. So if you enable you know, RDP ports to the internet, that's like an easy. Everybody's just port scanning and they're going to be access. Here's the interesting one. This is where it really starts paying off. Now you have a server with ports accessible to the internet that it actually got compromised. So think of that web server holding your research data that, you know, that server hosting some you know, personal information, PII information, now it got compromised. Most of the time, you don't know about it. Here, we're actually telling you, hey, you just got compromised. So let's go in there. And again, you'll get an email alert. You'll get notified. Let's, let's dive in there. So let's say you got that alert saying, hey, there's a, there's a security incident happening. It actually tells you. The incident started on this date, it was detected, and the attacker attacked other, this resource, it's a web front end. Right? Severity high, it's telling you the remediation step escalate to your security incident, and then a description of the incident. So there was a successful RDP group force attack. So let's, let's, follow, let's follow the chain. So once you click on that, it actually tells you there were several RDP login attempts 
from this IP into it actually tells you the, the source IP. And there, there were 60 failed attempts, and there was one, there was one successful login right here. So there's a whole bunch of failed login attempts, and then it actually logged in with one account into that server. Let's go back over here. So the next step, what happened? Once that account logged in, Azure Security Center was able to determine that a, a process was executed, svchost.exe. So what it was trying to do is, it, is it's saying, based on our behavior analytics, and based on our, our, our experience there, it says that process is usually used to masquerade malicious activity. So you actually have malware there that got executed on, on your server. It's telling you right over here. It's even telling you down below what your next step should be. So not only are we alerting you when you got when you got a server that got compromised because it actually successfully logged into an, to, a, to an account. Now it's telling you more information about the actual suspicious process. Telling you you know additional steps that you should take to to to, to remediate that. And then lastly here is actually went to the account that got compromised. So I'm already in the, in the third step here. Multiple domain accounts were queried. So once that malware was loaded, it started doing domain queries and saying, hey, what, you know, what else can I do? So that, that attacker not only compromised the web server, but now it's trying to do some other activities. So here it's already telling you there was other uh, queries that happened. And the latest account that was queried was Abby Becker. Okay. Now we also offer this option that says continue investigation. Here. Kind of like putting it all together in a visual form for you to see the initial source of attack and all the different queries that happen. So from the moment the security incident happened, uh, with a, with a brute force attack, the suspicious uh, SVC host process, to the multiple domain accounts, domain accounts, just following the whole chain of attack against your infrastructure. Again, this is just like cognitive services, just like you know, the power of using the cloud for giving you that insight. We're using those same technologies to really improve the security stance of your work. By providing you this sort of insight, being proactive about your security is how we gain the customer's trust, right? So for your research projects, for your workloads, I would I would say that you'll probably do a better job running those workloads in the cloud using these security tools than running it on, on prem in some instances. Now, again, Microsoft will really, they understand. Microsoft understands that this is going to be hybrid. So some of your work is going to be some of your work is going to be on prem. And Azure is the only public cloud that has an interest for, for both sides. So this sort of insight, this Azure Security Center and, and, and combined with log analytics, works with just it works with Azure workloads and also with on-premises workloads. So think about as as you look to leverage the public cloud, you'll be able to leverage even this security sort of insights both for your Azure workloads and for your on-premises. Any questions so far? So we touched high level on you know, like Azure overview of what's 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 available. We touched on eBird, some of the research technology that we've been working on. We touched on cognitive services, some of the work, great work that we're, we're doing with artificial intelligence, and how we're leveraging those artificial intelligence and machine learning behavior analytics to through security to make sure that we're, we're the most Trusted public cloud, the secure public cloud for your for your work. And I think at this time we want to do we want to go ahead and transition over to uh, Patrick for the next next step. Any before we transition over to Patrick, let me just show you real quick the Azure pricing calculator. So one of the things that we get a lot of questions is, okay, how do you, how do you price some of these services? We're here to help you. So 
So if, if there's anything you want to run, like so what if I want to run a high-performance compute cluster, run some analytics, show me like, like Cornell wanted to do with eBird. Feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're, we're a resource. There's also the Azure Pricing Calculator. So just do a quick search for Azure Pricing Calculator. All right. Yeah, we'll take a quick break right after this and then we'll, we'll continue. What we want to do is just quickly highlight the Azure Pricing Calculator. Just do a, a quick search on Azure Pricing Calculator and you'll be able to see all the different services, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it's security and identity, whether it's containers, databases, uh, storage. Just, again, just real quick, I'll just show you one that you get a lot of questions. Let's say you have a workload that you want to, let's say you have a workload that you want to provide disaster recovery. Now you want to replicate that workload to Azure in case there's an outage in your data center and you want to just replicate it to Azure. So you can go in here and just say, okay, say storage, called site recovery. You'll be able to add that right here. And then it'll tell you, just real quick, how many, how many virtual machines you want to protect. So we'll replicate your VMware machine, your physical server to Azure, have it there in case of a disaster. So if you have an outage in your data center, you can fail over to Azure, do that, you know, VR for VR purposes, and you can go ahead and run a quote here. So you can just go in here, okay, say I want to protect, say eight nodes. It's $25 a node, $200. So for $200, you can protect your you know, virtual machines that you're running these workloads, replicate them to Azure. And the only thing you'll pay steady state is $200 to protect your eight virtual machines plus the storage. So let's say, that virtual machine that you want to protect. Like, oh, I already have an example here. Okay. Right here. Those eight virtual machines was $25 each, $200. And let's say in total was 1.3 terabytes. That's another $62. So for $62, $260, eight virtual machines, 1.3 terabytes, you're able to protect those virtual machines to Azure for disaster recovery purposes. And again, if you wanted to run, you know, get an estimate for any other of the services we talked about, whether it's running a virtual machine, whether it's running storage, whether it's running high performance compute, you can run this calculator. Yeah, this is per month, but let me show you a great example. That's, that's a great question. We get that all the time. So let's say, let's take that example, storage. We know that storage is very cheap, right? So let's, let's do a quick, let's say I wanted to, I have a very difficult time here. Let's take storage for example. Let's go to Node Central VRC. So we talk about LRS, data. Let's say it's five terabytes. Two hundred and fifty six dollars a month. Down here on the load, you have this export option. So you can download that estimate, open it up to Excel.
I just want to make sure. I don't like that. It'll come on. Uh, you have the green light. Uh, All right, so just press that. It's just, just, just uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. This crap. Mm, that's smart.
want him to come do this because he knows way more about machines. Because when he, he, he emailed me, he's like, hey, I'm going to send you a deck. <laughs> Present that deck. Yeah. You got it. Don't worry. So I'm like, all right, man. And so I was like, don't give me, you don't have to give me anything. Uh, what I'm going to do, since he comes to play, he has about 10 all cognitive services from him. So I'll show that. I'll go through these slides pretty quick and I'll show that. I'll, I'll do a uh, keyword search and then take them links and upload the word files and send them to the Something like that. We'll see. I didn't get the slide there. Okay. All right, well, welcome back, and thank you so much for being a part of the round two, the second half of our Azure day here. Uh, so when we talk about Azure, there's a, obviously a billing component of it, and in order to have your own billing, we have what's called enrollments at Microsoft. So Essen has been managing, uh, along with our reseller SHI, some of the different billing enrollments. So there's an actual protocol that we have set up, and I believe Essen has shared that out um, with the research community in the past. If not, we'll make sure we share that again. But there's a link uh, and there's a way that we get them set up. So if you haven't already set up an Azure subscription, please let us know. We'd be happy to set one up with you. Additionally, by the end of the day, if you have to, if you have to leave for any reason or something comes up, no pressure. We would love to hear from you on anything we can work on further with you. So I've passed out my card in the room here. Uh, if anyone doesn't have it, please let me know. But we'd love an opportunity to work closely with you on anything that comes from this. So thank you very much. I'll have Patrick LeBlanc, wow. Patrick LeBlanc, I'll have him present on machine learning and some other fantastic data visualization. I like the walk. Hey. You guys hear me? Oh, I'm not gonna be able to use that. Hold the mic. That's all, right. That's all right. I'll use the mic. That's okay. It's okay. Go all the way away. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. No problem. It's okay. Oh, testing, testing. All right. You guys can hear me? I got to hold it like this close to say anything. But if I do that, you can't hear me. So I got to get really close. All right. My name is Patrick LeBlanc. I am a data platform professional at Microsoft. I do data. That's it. Um, I work with data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when I'm sleeping. Um, my wife says she wakes up and she sees my fingers doing this kind of stuff. It's strange, but 
it is what it is, right? I've been doing data for about 22 years, ever since I was about 23 years old. Um, and so machine learning, to be honest with you guys, I started doing some stuff with SAS back when I was working on my PhD that, let's not even talk about that, and um, I stopped. And then about a couple years ago, Microsoft introduced machine learning to me. And I started tinkering with it, and by far I am not an expert um, with machine learning. I'm sure you guys, you, most of you guys are researchers. Who, I, I was trying to listen in the back. How many of you guys are researchers? Yeah, mo it was a lot of people said they were researchers um, before, but now nobody's a researcher. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, there you go. And so we, really, we, we have an Azure base, Azure ML, that I, I think you guys were introduced to a couple of months ago. Um, and so we've actually updated it, and I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of what's new. And then I think you said something about text analytics. And so we have this thing called cognitive services that has all those APIs built into it that he was showing earlier. And I'm going to show you, so they told me I can do art if possible. So what I'm going to show you is how you can actually call those APIs from a product we have called Power BI and do some text analytics and keyword searches using that product. All right, um, so what's new? This is gonna be a struggle for me, but anyway, let's try it. So what's new in Azure ML? That's the agenda, we have to talk about that. So we recognize some trends in data science and particularly things like this, right? The rise of hybrid training. People wanna do their, build their experiments on premises. I mean, have their data on premises, but do their experiments in the cloud or vice versa. Um, different ways that they want to do things. They want to do them when they're not sitting at their desk or they're, you know, when they're not connected to the internet. Maybe I have a client that I can download and do have the same type of environment that I have if I was doing this in the cloud. And so data prep was a challenge um, for a lot of our, the people that we survey, model deployment, model lineage, and explaining the ability, right? And so this is what we think at Microsoft the machine learning or AI development life cycle looks like. You orchestrate your data, right? You have to ingest the data. You gotta go somewhere and get the data. Then you need to store it. Then you gotta prep and train those models to produce some type of outcome, to predict something, right? To do text analytics or one of the things that we're working on, and it's three of us that, that have my role at Microsoft is, we're trying to see who's gonna enroll next semester. And so we built out an experiment to try to predict who's gonna be in school next semester. And we wrote another experiment that predicts whether or not a kid from K-12 is going to succeed or fail. Just using some basic regression algorithms. Nothing too fancy, right? Um, nothing, you know, a whole bunch. Um, we actually used, we stored the data in a data lake, and then we processed it out using some USQL, which is something new that we have at Microsoft, and use Power BI to visualize it. And all the crux of this, right, this is where you would run your machine learning on top of the model, That's, this is where machine learning comes in um, to really help you out with this, all right? And so the ma machine learning studio has been in Azure for a bit. And has any of you guys, have any of you guys used this before? So it's just an, I'll show you this interface. It's just an interface, it's a drag and drop interface. You can write code, you can write R, you can write Python, you can do whatever you want. And I'll show you our, uh, one, the, one of the experiments we built. Um, it's just built into it. Um, We've learned from our, from our customers that they want more control, though, right? They want control of everything that they do. They don't want us to manage and maintain it, so we built this, these, these tools that you can download um, for better productivity, better building, better deployment, and things like that. And so the new capabilities is that you can do your experimentation and your modeling management on-premises because everything was based in the cloud before. And you can also start building your experiments, prepping your data and everything, on, on premises, and then you can decide where you actually want to train and run your models. You can run them against, you know, using our machine learning service. You can use Spark. You can actually use SQL Server now to do experiments. And so in SQL Server 2016, we um, incorporated R and Python. So you can actually call R and Python from SQL Server now. Um, and, or you can do it, you know, in containers. You can do it, like I said, you know, in Azure, completely up to you. And so how do you get all this stuff? Um, Azure. You start by, start by going into Azure. You go and look for cognitive services. You create an, um, a machine learning experiment. And then 
once you walk through the steps, you download your workbench. It works on both Windows and a Mac OS. So if you guys, uh, there's a couple of Mac machines in here. Um, and then you can manage everything using the workbench. So you don't have to go out to the cloud if you don't want to, but once you deploy and run your experiments, you can tell it which resources you want to run it on. Do you want to run it on a premises? Do you want to use a VM? Do you want to use a container? It's completely up to you. And this allows for scale, which we didn't have before, because when you created a, an experiment before, it actually spin up a little Linux VM behind the scenes, which very low compute, and a lot of people complain because it's kind of slow. And so if, even if you run an uh, experiment today, it's still kind of slow, but with the workbench, we're allowing you to scale it out so you can use your own resources behind the scene. And you can run experiments, you can have parallel processing of them to make it much, 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 much faster. Right? So what do you get? So basically, you get an experiment account that keeps track of your projects, allows you to scale up, and you can track the history, the run history of all your experiments. So like for us, for example, when we first started, when we were doing our linear regression, we found out we shouldn't be doing a linear regression. We should use you know, something a little more robust and, but we were able to track and watch, you know, how it improved over time. Um, but what was really important, because there were three, three of us working on it, trying to model the ma uh, manage the models. Because I would change something, then Dustin would change something, then Steve would change something, and we had no idea who was changing all this stuff. And now we can track and manage, you know, kind of like almost version control. We just kind of see who did it or who broke it. I was the one always breaking it. Uh, and Steve would fix it. So anyway. Um, so we have the experimenta experimentation service on your desktop using a command line, using VS Code, using our workbook or something like that. You can prep your data, build your experiments, and then you can publish them out to the service. You can do it locally, you know, anywhere you want. We actually have a machine learning server that's in Azure that you can click a button and say, hey, I want to deploy this to my tenant. And I, I deployed it the other day, and it comes pre-configured with everything you need to do to run your experiments. Within that VM, it takes about, it costs about $250 a month to run that VM if you run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and it takes about 14 minutes to deploy it. And so you just push a button and it starts spinning it up for you. And then when you, when you go through the process of deploying it, it says, hey, what do you want the server name to be? What do you want the username, the administrator account? How do you want to connect to the SQL server? You know, so you just got, I mean, you got to document that stuff. So I forgot, I didn't do it the first time. I thought I could remember the passwords, and then I had to rebuild it. So, yeah, right, right. Okay. Um, so the experimentation, ser experimentation service, like I said, it can run um, anything you want. So you use your favorite IDE and any framework. So the, the challenge we had before is you had to use our cloud. Now you can use Visual Studio, Spark, ML. Get Docker, any anything you want. You bring your own IDE to this. It's pretty nice. Um, model management services. This is what we used a lot, Steve, Dustin, and I. Um, and so I actually just went to a Docker training class because I had no idea what Docker was. I thought they were talking about docking a boat, but they actually weren't. Um, they were talking about containers. Um, and so it's helped us out a lot um, here. And so you can see you can deploy it over HTTP. It's completely container-based. And the thing that we like the most, because I write R, Dustin writes Python, and Steve writes them all. He's the smartest guy on our team. And so it's first class support for all of them. And so I didn't have to go learn Python to do it, right? I just took the native language that I needed to get my experiments done, and Dustin took what he needed, and on and so forth, right? And so once you are done with your experiments, you can actually publish them as a web service, then you can use Excel to run your experiments. And so that's how we have our clients. So I can connect to it. There's a plugin for um, Azure ML. And so it gives you a list. And if you have in inputs that you need to provide. So for us, one thing that we found for our who's going to attend next semester, oddly enough, one of the best predictors was how many hours they're taking this semester. It's like, well, that should be pretty common. But it's not pretty common. Um, a lot of students start with 15 hours and, believe it or not, end up part time. Um, and so if they're dropping classes, they may not be here next semester. And we found that as one of the best predictors. It wasn't grades. It wasn't GPA or anything like that. It was actually how many courses they're taking um, this semester, hours, actually. So it was pretty interesting. And so we made that one of our primary predictors. And so once I connect this to Excel, it says, hey, give me a list of them or give me one. And I put it in um, with some other, a few other attributes, and it'll tell me whether or not that kid will be in school next semester. And if you guys want a copy of the experiment, just let me know. Email me. Copy of the experiment. 
that we did. And then VS Code. VS Code is free. Visual Studio Code is free. Um, you can download it for free. It's just like Visual Studio. I don't know if you guys are using Visual Studio, um, but you can download it for free. We have extensions into VS Code where you can start building out your own experiments, run your jobs, and then you can publish them out. And again, right, it's on top of all the goodness, Python, R, Git, everything. It's just kind of baked in. What we're trying to do is give you a single platform for everything. So I'm, um, I was in a meeting and I was watching Satya talk and he said, Microsoft is no longer an AN company. We're an OR. We work with this or this or this or this. We actually tried to work with PlayStation um, because we're doing a lot of analytics and AI around Xbox. And so we tried to work with PlayStation and said, hey, you know what, guys? There's a lot of information to be gathered. So instead of having two separate online gaming platforms, let's work together. So if I have an Xbox and you have a PlayStation, we could play whatever these video games that kids are playing today against each other. My son is an a, a Xboxaholic. That's what I call him. And um, they were excited. Everyone was excited. And PlayStation came back and said, no way, Microsoft. We don't want to play with you. So, well, we'll work on it next time. The workbench, the workbench, you install it locally. Okay? So instead of going up to Azure and do your data prep and build your experiments and everything, you download it, you install it, and you build it locally. It's a full environment. Right now, the it's, a, it's in preview right now. The, building the experiments, mm, I'm very candid, right? I work for Microsoft. I drink the Kool-Aid. Mm, it's okay. Okay? It's okay. I still do all my experiments in Azure, in the cloud right now, just because a few things just don't work very well. Um, it's not very intuitive yet, but they're working on it. I saw the next release. It'll get better next time. Um, but what's really good about it is data wrangling. And so we actually have a project, and I'll show you what Pros is in a little bit, where it really exposes a lot of data wrangling. If I need to get some data, merge some data, split some data, parse some data, then I can export it out and use it. You know, it allows me to clean up my data really well um, for my experiments. Because you know you got to get your data into a certain shape like this before you can run your experiments on it. And it's a really good tool for that right now. And it, it actually does some really good visualizations of your data. So it kind of gives you some good profiling tools so you can see the distribution of data and things like that. All right? Um, so, oh, man, I thought I hit this slide. This is how much stuff costs. I'll let Joey talk to you guys about how much stuff costs, not me, right? I'm not the, the price guy. Um, but this is our portfolio, right? And this is how we, we, we think it should work. But the reason I left this slide in is you can use whichever engine you want to use. And I don't know if you guys noticed the theme in that. You can use whatever you want to use. Obviously, we want you to use SQL Server and our stuff, but you can use anything you want. Hadoop, Spark, it's, it's your world um, now. All right, so where can you learn more? Just go out, and I'll give these slides to, I guess, one of you guys so you can share. I have three decks, actually. But that um, link right there will take you to get started so you can learn about all types of stuff. And the workbench is on work to GA. It should be GA before the end of this calendar year. All right? Okay. So I'm going to show you guys two things. All right. Two things. So in Azure ML, so this is just um, the, the ML studio, studio.azureml.net. And so if you guys already have Azure subscription, you just go to that um, account and sign in and create an experiment. So I've created a couple of experiments, and you can see right here in this experiment, it's a, actually a drag and drop interface. And so this is one of our early experiments where we were all learning, and right here, we actually had a linear regression. And we showed this to a group of data scientists, and they all laughed at us, ha, 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 ha. And we were like, what's so funny? They're like, well, nobody uses linear regression anymore um, for classification of anything. And we were like, well, of course. And they're like, no, you silly boys. Um, and so they actually, there's a cheat sheet that you can go to that um, Microsoft provides to help you determine do you need two class, do you need, you know, what type of regressions you need to run. And they pointed us to that website and we went through and we actually needed, you know, the two class logistic regression. Um, but basically what this experiment does is I get some data from a SQL server. So it could be on-premises SQL, it could be wherever you want. I go get some data and then I begin to, um, you know, select my features, right? I get my columns that I want to experiment, and then I can clean up some missing data, and say, hey, if I have some blanks, make them zeros. So you can be that simple, or you can get really complex with it. You can write an R script 
to clean up your data or a Python script. It's completely up to you. And then I split the data because what we also learned in our um, naivety was that we need to run two, we need to, this gives us the ability to run two different regressions so we can decide which one is the best. And so we split the data and we're running a boosted and a logistic. And we actually found out the boosted was a little better to determine who's gonna enroll next year. And so we use this tuning. This was really cool. Um, Steve actually found this. This guy actually helped us determine which features would yield the best results for our prediction. And it was actually, that's where we found out the credit hours would be the, the better one, all right? And so then when you're done, you can set this up as a web service and you can make API, you can call this from your applications, from Excel, you never have to come back to this once you publish it. And now I can build it into applications and things like that and that's what we're working on doing right now. Um, we actually have a hackathon that we're building and then you'll be able to, you bring your own data and we build out a complete analytic solution and then we have a web page where you'll be able to upload the results of it and it'll call this machine learning model and yield out the results and show you, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a teacher or a professor at this university, now I can see which one of my students are likely not, you know, who will drop out of school next semester. So we'll see, it's fun, all right? Just, we're learning, we're learning as we go. All right, so the next thing I wanna show you guys, somebody was talking about text analytics, and we have this thing, I'm gonna show you. Um, again, I work for Microsoft, so um, I like to use Bing. I thought that would get a little chuckle, right? Uh, I thought that would get a little chuckle. <laughs> I thought that would get a chuckle. I'm sorry? It does pay me. I, I won't go into that. Ask me about that later and I'll tell you about that. My son really enjoys it. Um, so it pays me every time I search, I get points. And so you get Xbox dollars. And so I think I have 11,000, but he's trying to get to 15. And so he, he'll just come to my machine and he'll send himself an email and then he gets all the Xbox dollars he wants, right? So you can get Starbucks cards and all types of stuff from it, right? They pay you, all right. So these cognitive services, I was really interested in this because I was actually working with Harvard University last spring and they had a group of researchers and they wanted to do text analytics over teacher evaluations. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Just send them an analysis, simple, right? Simple sentiment analysis uh, to see how the students felt about a given teacher. And so they wouldn't let me keep the data because there was some really bad sentiment for some of the professors. Um, but it wasn't the professors that where kids were succeeding, I mean failing. It was actually the professors where the kids were succeeding. So it was strange what we found. Um, but anyway, so, um, but they didn't want to do a whole bunch of work. They didn't want to develop out their own algorithms. They didn't want to write their own code for this algorithm. I was like, oh, hey, we got some stuff at Microsoft. And so if you go to this page, you can go to um, language, and you can see there's text an a text analytics API, okay? So I click on the text analytics API. Oh, I clicked it, there we go. And you type some text in. You can say, Patrick is the smartest person I have ever met in my life, right? Maybe not true, and then I click analyze, and what it'll do is it's gonna do some um, key phrase detection, come on, there we go, 99% um, sentiment, see that? And smartest person I, Patrick. I don't know where that came from, but um, pretty high sentiment, right? So let's just change one word. Um, Let's just add not so smart. See what it does, right? I've never done this demo before. This is live. This is my first time doing this. Um, click analyze. Let's see what it does to the sentiment. Boof, drops the sentiment tremendously, right? So they had a batch of data. These guys had like, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows of data that they wanted to do sentiment on. And they were like, well, we're not gonna type each one and transcribe that sentiment for each one. I was like, well, that's what you get. And they say, well, we're not working with Microsoft. I said, I kid, I kid, I kid. Let me show you guys something, okay? Let's pretend, let's, you guys use your imagination with me. Let's pretend that I have this CSV file that has some, just some text in it, right? Just some comments, okay? You guys follow me? Just random comments. And I, you know, I just copied this from somewhere. So um, you got this CSV file, and we have this product called Power BI Desktop. How many of you guys have heard of Power BI? Oh. Man, all right, at least one person. Whew. So Power BI, the desktop is free. 
So what I'm about to show you, you can download this for free and you start using this today. It doesn't cost you any pennies, nothing. Microsoft doesn't want your credit card, doesn't want anything. Just go to PowerBI.com and download it. It is a all-in-one, and um, Chad likes to use it a lot to tell us that we're not selling stuff. Um, so, <laughs> okay, and so I'm automatically signed in because at Microsoft we have Active Directory Federation service and everything set up, and it's all linked together, so it automatically authenticates me. You don't have to sign in, okay? You just can close this and get to working. So let's do this. I'm going to go get my data from my CSV file. Hopefully I can remember where I saved it. Yep, there we go. So I click open. And so what I'm doing is called data wrangling right now. So I can go get data from lots of different disparate data sources. I can get it from Oracle, SQL. I can scrape a web page. I can do just about, I can get data. Anywhere I have an OLADB or ODBC connection, I can go and get my data, okay? So where did my data go? Maybe I messed up. Let's try it again. Okay, let's do this. Let's do one thing. There we go. That's the problem right there. All right. Let's try it one more time. My apologies. Set us for this big build up, Patrick, and you let us down. All right. This is true, though. This is what we did with Harvard, and it actually worked out for them pretty well. So I open up the desktop. There we go. And we go get some data. And I actually did this while I was sitting in the back. Um, I built this demo just a few minutes ago. Uh, that's just what I like to do, live on the edge. So let's just use this one because I think this one showed that it actually was kind of, if you had a false positive, it actually didn't know how to handle it. And I was kind of looking at it. So I sent some comments off. I already sent some comments in, hey, which algorithm did you use? Of course, like you said, they're not going to tell us. Um, that's the secret sauce. So when you go and connect to the data, it gives you a preview and it says, hey, this is a CSV file, whatever. But you click, don't click low, click edit. Okay, click edit. And when I, I'm going to send a OneDrive link to Joey with like five decks and a shortcut to the step-by-step -step on how to do this. Okay. And so now here's my data. And I can begin to shape and model my data using the desktop. Right? There's a whole ribbon here for transform. So I can, you know, replace values, detect dates, I can do statistics, I can do all types of stuff against this data. But what we want to do is we want to make an API call out to cognitive services so I can do text analytics over the comments, okay? And I'm like, all right, how do you do this? So I, I was thinking, and so with cognitive services, the first time you sign up for it, it gives you an API key, okay? That's all you need is the API key. I give you the code. So I've already written the code. So inside of this, we have a programming language called M, which stands for mashup. It allows you to take your data and mash it up. You can do make API calls. You can do all types of stuff to it. And you can write functions. And so I'm not going to write these functions. I, I bumbled through them in the back to make sure they were working. So here's a couple of functions that I will wrote. One function will extract the key phrases right there, and one function will Give me the sentiment, okay? So I'm gonna copy the first function. Go over to Power BI Desktop, and right here on Home, I can say New Source, and just choose a blank query, and go to Advanced Editor. I'm just showing you what's possible, right? What's possible, and replace that with my code. Um, click Done, and so it named it Query 1. We're gonna call it Key Phrases. Okay, so that's the first one. So I made a function. This function accepts text as the parameter or the value. And so whenever I call that function, it's going to call out to my API. And so I'll show you right here. Let me go back to my notepad. I'll, when I'm creating the other one, I'll show you what it's doing. This one's just extracting, giving me, returning the sentiment. So I'll do a new one, blank query, and I'll show you what the code is doing actually here. Advanced editor. There we go. And so I'll show you what it's doing. So it's just an API call, and that's the API that it's calling for my cognitive account that I created. And what it, do, what it does is it goes through and it returns a JSON file. So I'm just extracting out the contents of the JSON, and I'm returning, I, I meant to, yeah, I'm returning the sentiment. And it's just a percentage. The closer to one, the higher the sentiment, the lower, to, you know, the closer to zero, the lower the sentiment. 
Make sense? Okay, so these are just function calls, and you can see at the top, it takes text as the value, so I need to pass some text to it for it to run it. Make sense? All right, so watch this. Let me show you. So I have my table, and I want to just add a column to my table that's going to give me my key phrases and give me my sentiment for those comments, right? So add column, invoke a function. Well, let's rename this one. I don't like that. Just, we don't have a lot of time there. Call it sent. And so invoke a function, and we can say we're going to invoke the key phrases function, and we're going to pass comment and click OK. And I did something wrong to this guy right here. Let me see. Let's see, advanced editor. Oh, got to say OK. There we go. There we go. And then if you look, right, when we invoke that, you can see every step that I take of changing my data, it tracks it. But look what it did. It extracted out the key phrases for me out of that text because I just made that API call. So now I'm right in this desktop. I made an API call. And then what I can also do is do invoke function and say call the sentiment, pass my text column to it. See right there, click OK, give it a second, and there's my sentiment. And so the one at the top was just squirrely. I was reading the text, and it was just, that is wrong. So just please ignore that one. I was going to delete it out, but it's not perfect. This is what I, so I was going to, I had a clean data set where you can see everything was perfect. I was like, that's not fair. Let's not cheat. All right, let's show some problems. So there's definitely some problems with the sentiment. But once I'm done, you know, the great thing about this is I can visualize this data now. So not only can Power BI wrangle and structure data and make API calls, but let's say I wanted to make a word cloud from those key phrases, right? So we have, so it's loading the data up. I can make a, <laughs> give me a second, you guys laughing at me? Oh, I do too, but it's just a great way to show you. Right? Yeah, so you can click right here, and not only do we have these native visuals, but you can write your own visuals. You can use R to create your own visuals using R, okay? And so we have a store here. You can go to the store, and all of our visuals are open source for you developers out there. So if you don't like those visuals, you can create your own, or you can go to the store, and these are free, and you can go and download all of your own visuals. There's the wonderful word cloud that I know you love so much. We can click add, just as much as I love pie charts. And so... <laughs> Click it, there's my word cloud, and then I go find my key phrases, and it's going to give us so much valuable information in this word cloud after it spins up. Actually, not much valuable information. There you go. And so because I didn't take out the ofs and the does, the d's, and all that, it's saying that of is the best one. But within a matter of moments, right, if I wouldn't been talking so much about it, just down working, I could have gotten this done over that. Did you I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. So, you know, what you can do is, so I want to get rid of of. Let's say I want to get rid of of because it's just skewing my results, right? So you got two choices. In the desktop, we have an expression language called DAX, Data Analytic Expressions. How many of you guys use, don't use Excel, All right? You've used it before. Yeah. How many of you guys never used Excel, All right? Everybody uses Excel. And you've written a sum in Excel before. DAX, Data Analytic Expressions, is an extension of the Excel expression language, we just added lots of capabilities. So like if I wanted to search this text, I can say switch contains of replace blank. Or I can go here and edit queries and do a conditional column and walk through a wizard to say, don't include of in my, my search. So you, If I have a, if I can make that call to get it, yes. Okay. Yes, if I can make the call, just like I did for this, if I can make the call, and then I can do a merge on those two and say ignore these in that text. So yeah, you can. Yep. All right. And so I can continue to, you know, visualize this data if I want to, um, over and over, word clouds, average sentiment, and things like that. Yes. Yeah, so back in the slides, that's what I was saying. So that's what we, we went from. So before, in Azure ML, you just got these really small little virtual machines. And they run on screen. Now you can actually point it to what you want it to run. So I can say point it to these 15 Hadoop, you know, these Hadoop clusters, and run it on screen. Back there. You can see up to you. So how many stores do you need? How many machines do you need? It's all up to you now. Before, we didn't couldn't do that.
So. Yes. 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 So when he was talking earlier, it used the exact same. Using the exact same question because they don't expose this. If you want, to, you can. You would have to build your own to bring your own dictionaries and stuff like that. And there's actually a template. If you go to uh, the um, Azure ML, there's a list of uh, templates that we have lots of different experiments that's already built. And one of them is for sentiment analysis. And then you can bring your own. You have to write your own, publish it as a web service. And you can replace it all instead of using their API. You would use your own. But for this one, it's hands up, and then I can see it. So, but it's a great, great demo, right? It's a great demo. Yeah. The art of the possible. That's what they told me I was supposed to show today. I just came up with it a few minutes ago. So, close, close call. All right? So one of the options I didn't show, you can connect to just about anything you want, and I'll show you this. So if I choose Get Data and select More, so the question is, what can I connect to with this desktop? So I'll, I'll kind of give you guys quick, and you guys tell me when to stop talking. You shouldn't have invited me if you didn't want me to talk. Uh, so I got to stop. Okay. Oh, well, let me answer his question. I can if you guys give me like a week, because um, I'm gonna yes I will um, I will give send Joy a OneDrive, and then it'll have a sample that I built right here with the code built in, and there's gonna be four slide decks. And if there's anything else you guys want, just let me know. Okay, yeah, I'll send them a OneDrive link where you can download all of it. All right, I'm just traveling. I don't get home until next Friday. So, uh, all right, so. All the data sources you can connect to. The first thing, right, you collect the flat files. What I like about this, though, so you can connect to the obvious ones, but look at this, a folder. And so if you, if you receive CSV files every day, same type of CSV file, just different data in it, you point to that folder, Power BI will automatically combine them into one data set for you, okay? So that's one, one, data, one set. Databases, name one, right? Um, SQL Server, obviously, the number one. Access, number two. Oracle, a close number three behind uh, Access. Just kidding, just kidding, right? Oracle's right above Access, uh, and I'm below SQL Server. Anyway, right, they're all great platforms. But any of the relational database platforms that you can think of, Azure, there you go, right? HD Insight, anything you want to connect to. You can go and analyze your Facebook data. I know you guys are big Facebook users like me. Um, I'm posting, I just posted that I was presenting at Indiana University, so you can go analyze that. Yep. Yes, so the question is, does this have the ability to display geolocated data? Absolutely, we have four different mapping types. Um, there's two built in there's, that, that just uses the Bing map services to display data. The third one uses, you can bring your own shape file, and the fourth one is completely integrated with Esri. So, and then we have some custom visuals, one called the synoptic panel. Let's say we wanted to display, you know, everybody, each one of these as, as somebody attending a class. So you can go and use the synoptic panel to say each one of these is a point. Each seat is a point and associate metadata to it. And then if I have my data, I can associate that data to those metadata points. And as people appear in class, that you know, I can have this turn red, this turn green based on who's sitting in class. Because you can do real-time streaming dashboards. I actually have a video out that shows you how to set that up using Flow and uh, Stream API. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Guy in the Cube, so if you go check it out, um, it's out there. All right, and so, and then the last thing, if you want, you can use all these other sources. You can scrape web pages that contain tables. If that's not enough, we open source all of these connectors so you can build your own connectors if we don't have one out there for you. All right, okay, so the question, oh, am I gonna make it available? That's right, all right, anything else? I'm way out of time. I'm way over time. I know. Okay. All right. So with that said, I will get all this zipped up, all these slide decks. These are like level 200. They walk into some really technical things. Um, but I didn't know where I was going, so I had all of them open. So I'll zip all this stuff up and put it on the OneDrive and share it with you guys. Thank you guys so much um, for having me. All right. I don't know who's next. Oh, all right.
Oh, well, shuck, I could have kept talking. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much. All right. Um, just gonna and gonna give you the other presentations. We'll get them yes. all up to you guys. Let me, uh, go back and flash this information for people. This is the last Thank you. 